Welcome back to Stroke Busters, a podcast presented by the Institute for Stroke and Cerebrovascular Disease at UT Health Houston. On this show, we connect with leaders in stroke care, research, community, and academia. We're not just active, we're at the forefront. Recognized as the first comprehensive stroke center in the state and pioneers in launching the nation's first mobile stroke unit. I'm Amy Quinn, Communications Director for the Stroke Institute, and proud to bring you another episode to share expert insights, groundbreaking research, and real stories from the forefront of medicine. It's that time again for a Grand Rounds follow-up interview. Dr. Luciano Spasato, Professor of Neurology, Western University, joined us for Grand Rounds at the McGovern Medical School here in Houston, Texas, and presented on the future of cardiac monitoring and anticoagulation after ischemic stroke and TIA. Following his Grand Rounds presentation for trainees and students, one of our stroke fellows, Jacob Samberski, stuck around to ask some more in-depth questions. Let's dive right in. My name is Jacob Samberski, and I'm currently a vascular neurology fellow at UT Houston Health Science Center and Texas Medical Center. Today, we have a very special guest joining us on Stroke Busters, who is regarded as one of the international leaders in the field of stroke and neurocardiology. Dr. Luciano Spasato is a professor of neurology and the head of the stroke program at the Department of Clinical Neurological Sciences, London Health Sciences Center at Western University in London, Ontario, Canada. He is a stroke neurologist and clinical researcher with cross appointments with the departments of epidemiology and biostatistics and anatomy and cell biology. Dr. Spasato is the inaugural Kathleen and Henry Barnett Chair in Stroke Research, and he's the director of the Heart and Brain Lab at Western University. He is the associate, an associate scientist at Robarts Research Institute and an adjunct scientist at Lawson Health Research Institute. Dr. Spazzato is the inaugural chair of the World Stroke Organization Brain and Heart Task Force and holds several editorial roles in the leading peer reviewed journals in the field of stroke and cardiology, including Stroke, Neurology, and the Journal of American Heart Association. His research focuses on the brain and heart connection. He leads a multidisciplinary translational research program involving epidemiological, clinical, and experimental studies. Among his most impactful contributions, he described the clinical and pathophysiological concept of AFDAS, or atrial fibrillation detected after stroke, and the pathophysiological process leading to cardiovascular complications in stroke patients called stroke-induced heart injury, or SIHI, conditions that affect over 5 million people per year globally. He has published over 180 papers in stroke and neurocardiology and has been invited to lecture at 350 national and international conferences in over 50 countries spanning four continents. Thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Spisato. Thank you for inviting me. So I'd like to first give the audience an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. And I was wondering if you can tell us your story about how you discovered neurology as your passion and your career and your research interest in cardioembolic stroke. Great. Um, so w- when I was younger and I was deciding uh, what to do in terms of specialty, my chief resident, I, I was an internal medicine resident in Argentina, and my chief resident told me um, that she wanted me to prepare a presentation about stroke. So I, I started l- reading and getting interested in stroke and and since the very first minute i I said this is what i want to do and thanks uh, to that i decided to pursue uh, um, neurology residency and then i I trained in stroke and that's how we ended up doing stroke and in terms of of neurocardiology i always liked cardiology i was in between cardiology and neurology in terms of specialties and um, and when I uh, when I was a faculty, I was invited to develop a stroke center at a, at a um, hospital where there were only cardiology uh, patients. And I got interested in, in some telemetry uh, systems that they had and allowed me to monitor uh, the heart rhythm of, of stroke patients. And that's how I got into the world of, of cardiac monitoring in stroke patients. And that was about um, 2006. And since then, I have been doing research in the same field. Oh, what an impactful moment. We, uh, I believe a lot of patients and a lot of us, you know, entering the field or already in the stroke field have uh, a lot of thanks towards that one resident that had you uh, present on stroke. So that way, you know, we can all work alongside you and benefit from your work today. So um, that's such a great story. 
um, with you know, with multiple trials most recently, uh, Artesia and Elon addressing atrial fibrillation and stroke. Where do you think the field is moving towards in, in regards to treatment for primary and secondary prevention of stroke um, when it comes to AFib detection? And should all AFDAS be treated with anticoagulation? Yeah, you know, that, that's a question that we have been trying to answer for, for many years now. And I and overall, I, if I had to summarize it in just one sentence, I would say that uh, we're moving towards a more personalized kind of um, secondary or primary stroke prevention approach. And, and that means that we have learned so much about factors that can modify or influence stroke risk that we should not ignore them and we should try to incorporate them as part of our usual decision-making process. Um, these factors are um, uh, the presence of atrial cardiopathy or BNP, uh, increased left atrium, uh, other biomarkers such as troponin, uh, maybe um, the presence of, of low flow in the left atrial appendage, which can be very easily measured on, on CT or, or, uh, um, or uh, echocardi echocardiography. Um, so I think we should put in, in we should try to combine um, those factors in the best way possible and then determine which patients are at higher risk of stroke and, and, um, and offer them an individualized approach. Uh, based on on um, the most accurate estimates that we can uh, get. Do you think there's any utility in EKG gated CTA or cardiac MRI in the evaluation of these patients, even maybe more, spe more so specifically in cryptid uh, cryptogenic stroke or cardiac thrombus? Yeah, I think there's a huge future in, in that field. Uh, the, the first studies by uh, Dr. Coutinho um, in the Netherlands and some other groups, there's a Canadian group from, uh, from Kingston and uh, some other groups have investigated in observational studies the presence of left atrial appendage thrombi uh, just by extending the, uh, the CTA that we do for all acute stroke patients. And they have found up to 13% of cases of left atrial thrombus just by extended, extending the, the CTA six centimeters below the carina. So uh, I think there's a huge future there. Uh, we, are, uh, we are currently um, running a randomized, a single center randomized controlled trial in which patients are imaged according to the usual protocol. And the other, uh, the other group is imaged uh, to involve the left atrial appendage. And we have found a lot of uh, thrombi, but the issue is that since images are not high quality, the problem is that uh, sometimes it, it is very difficult to determine if it's just slow flow within the left atrial appendage that it's um, that causes the lack of contrast, or if it's an actual thrombus. So we're working around that to see if uh, if there are any markers that we can identify as as reliable predictors of thrombus uh, versus uh, slow flow. And uh, but but regardless, I think it's a it's a yeah it's where the field will move towards because uh, it can be done in a few seconds without excessive radiation, and, and it can provide very useful information regardless of whether we are able to identify if it's slow flow or a thrombus. Um, it that th that finding can direct further investigations such as TE or a dedicated gated CTA. Right. Yeah, I was thinking that would only increase our specificity or positive predictive value of those of those studies that we, I feel, tend to be hesitant to order on these patients due to the invasive nature of a TEE, but it would then offer so much more towards their care and allowing us to really find the etiology of these of these strokes. Um, so I, I think I completely agree moving towards incorporating that into the acute stroke workup would really um, expedite the workup of these patients in the inpatient setting. Do you I, think there are any characteristics of AFib that would make you more likely to treat with anticoagulation for primary prevention or after high-risk TIA as opposed to the realm of secondary stroke prevention? Yeah, so um, you know, we know that um, finding AFib on an ECG is, is um, there's no question that patients should receive an equivalence if they have a CHASPA score of one or, or maybe two. 
So for those patients, there is no question. So if they had a stroke or a TIA, then um, they, they should receive an equivalence because both assign two points to the chest blood score, and that's what all guidelines suggest. Um, of course, the chest blood score is not perfect. Uh, if you look at different cohorts, uh, the chest, the, pre, the predicted uh, stroke uh, rate varies across those co cohorts. It can go from, for example, for a chest blood score of two, it can go from 1% per year to 15% per year. So it's not perfect, but at least there is kind of agreement that uh, all patients should receive an equivalence. Um, so, but in that case, would be secondary stroke prevention. For primary stroke mm -hmm. prevention, I think uh, for ECG detected AFib, I, I, I don't question it if, if uh, there are other risk factors. For device detected AFib, I would, I know we have just one trial, it's Artesia. We have uh, partial data from NOAA AFNet, uh, which goes in the same, which goes in the same direction. But um, I would like to see more sub-analysis and, and more, um, yeah, more papers, uh, which I'm sure will come out from Artesia showing how we can better select patients. And do you think low ejection fraction plays a role in any of these workups, even without detected AFib? Should these patients be considered to be treated with anticoagulation? Well, that's, that's another interesting clinical question. So uh, what do we know about uh, decreased ejection fraction, which we can define as less than 40% in some trials, less than 30% in others? Mm -hmm. What we know so far is that um, stroke has never been the primary outcome measure for any of those trials because uh, in patients with heart failure, death is 10 times more frequent than stroke. So. Uh, there is a huge competing risk as, uh, related to death, uh, vascular or any cause death in those trials. So, if we uh, if we wanted to look at at um, stroke as, an, as a primary outcome, we would need a, a trial ten times larger than the ones that have been done so far. So, that that's the number one impediment. So, what can we do? Well, we can look at stroke as a secondary outcome, which is not the same. Uh, in terms of methodology, but it can provide us with interesting information. And there have been at least six or seven trials which used different doses of anticoagulants compared to aspirin. And in most of them, there is a very clear direction towards benefit uh, from anticoagulants compared to, uh, to aspirin in terms of ischemic stroke prevention. So my approach in general is because I know there will not be um, there will not be a clinic. It will be very unlikely to to have a, a new clinical trial to answer that question. So my approach is to look at meta analysis. There has there have been a couple of meta analyses showing that uh, anticoagulants are are beneficial, or suggesting that uh, that anticoagulants are beneficial in patients with decreased ejection fraction. So um, and then and that risk. Is, I'm sorry, that um, benefit in terms of effect size, it's similar to the one for AFib. So if we use an equivalent for patients with reduced ejection fraction, we can prevent that about the same number of strokes uh, that we could prevent by using them in patients with AFib. The only difference between AFib and heart failure, and this is a meta-analysis by the group of Martin O'Donnell published in stroke, I think that was in, uh, it was in 2021, if I'm not wrong, or 2020. So it showed that the, the main differences between, or the main difference between heart failure and AFib trials in the meta-analysis is that only in patients with heart failure, there is a, a, a twice higher risk of stroke of uh, major bleed. So patients with heart failure tend to have more major bleeding than patients with atrial fibrillation. So it's a cost that we need to consider in terms of the net uh, benefit um, ratio analysis. Um, but in general, I, 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 patients with, with a recent stroke with no uh, evident cost and with only heart failure as a potential cause, um, I usually tend to uh, discuss it with the patient very thoroughly and, uh, and use um, uh, an anticoagulant if uh, indicated. If the most frequent cause of left ventricular thrombi, uh, in, in terms of, of uh, epidemiology or population-based, is heart failure. So uh, it wouldn't be surprising if these patients have um, uh, 
had uh, uh, and thrombus and it's not there anymore because it, it went to one of the brain arteries. So in, in that case, I would recommend doing a cardiac CT because the sensitivity of, of, a, of an echocardiogram is pretty low for a left ventricular thrombi, mostly when they are um, laminar and they are adherent to the left ventricular wall. So in those cases, a CT is much more accurate or sensitive. Very interesting. And do you think that maybe atrial fibrillation in these patients is really like an end stage form of heart failure and that these patients may just progress to AFib and that might be um, a reason to anticoagulate them? Maybe it's not meeting a threshold that we would typically want to anticoagulate them undoubtedly, but then eventually over time, you know, the the amount of time that they spend in AFib ends up increasing, and this is really just a result of, of poor systolic function. Yeah, that, that, that's very interesting because we know uh, quite well that AFib is a cause of heart failure, uh, and that has been very clearly demonstrated by uh, causal analysis. Um, so, so they're, they correlate quite substantially, right? And they coexist quite substantially as well. So um, if AFib is a cause of heart failure, or if um, heart failure is a cause of AFib, uh, there have been some studies suggesting that there might be a relationship as well. So um, it's difficult sometimes to know if it's the chicken or the egg, or if it's something else that happened before, such as um, ischemic heart disease that caused both heart failure and atrial fibrillation, right? Or a valvular abnormality. So uh, it's usually quite difficult to, to know what, what came first and what is the cause of the other, which is a cause and which is a consequence. The jury will is still out. <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to continue to keep an eye on the trials. I do have one more question for you regarding uh, data that has already been um, you know, gifted to us before I ask you one or two questions about what you think the future holds. And that is in recent trials like Navigate and Respect, ESIS and Arcadia, our field has really attempted to address the idea of embolic stroke of undetermined source or cryptogenic stroke uh, by investigating if there's benefit to direct oral anticoagulants and secondary stroke prevention, but it's really yet to show any clinical benefit. Uh, with your work with AFTAS, it really seems to be a higher stroke risk in AFib detected either by EKG or short-term monitoring, but the long-term monitoring, uh, maybe not as much. Do you think, um, you know, if you analyze the Kaplan-Meier curves for bleeding risk with DOAX in comparison to aspirin in the RESPECT study, it really sh seems to have a divergence of risk of major bleeding at the 270-day mark. Do you think there is any benefit in anticoagulating these patients in the short term while we do short-term cardiac monitoring? And if there's no AFib detected, then maybe transition over to an antiplatelet? Then, yeah, you know, that, that's something that um, some of my colleagues have, uh, have done for a while. Um, but you know that I think the key seek, the the key point here is to start monitoring patients as soon as possible, rather than using an equivalence until we have the results. So, for example, when we go and see someone in the emergency department, we already go with the monitor in their pocket. So we say hi, how are you? We examine the patients. If we think it was um, it, it is in line with stroke symptoms, we apply the heart monitor, and then then in 14 days we will probably have an answer. If there's no AFib in those 14 days, it would be very unlikely to find, not, I, would, I wouldn't say very unlikely, but if we find AFib in the long term, it might not be such high risk or, or such uh, so, so dangerous, right? So if we, if we could use 14 or 30 day holders uh, with real time transmission of, of AFib related episodes, uh, that might be the real uh, the real approach, and um, we could uh, we could use a, a pill in the pocket approach for for those patients, right? We could tell them as soon as we receive the report, we can tell them, well, you need to fill the prescription for a DOAC and starting start taking it uh, as soon as possible. When I was in Argentina, I remember uh, that patients were admitted to telemetry, and I. I I was very thorough in the way that we uh, reviewed those telemetry recordings. And most of the episodes did happen in the first 14, in the first 30, 72 hours. 
So 70% wow. of the AFib paroxysms happened within the first three days, and then they tended to disappear, even in patients with, uh, with healthy hearts. So it means that, that I still think that uh, the, the sooner we start monitoring patients, the higher the chances of detecting AFib. I see. So making sure that prior to discharge, these patients truly leave with some form of cardiac monitoring rather than, you know, re, you know, resorting to going outpatient and doing a loop or a, or a halter, but getting it. So that way there's a seamless transition from telemetry to cardiac monitoring. Yeah, or even if we if they are not admitted to our unit, if we only see them as outpatients because they had a TIA or minor stroke, they go home with a recorder from the emergency department. Oh, wow. Okay. I think that's fantastic. And that's interesting. The time, the relation to the time from the you know, the episode, whether it resolved or the stroke onset is so important in determining really the, the importance of the AFib. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that's something that has not been explored um, uh, quite um, in, in a lot of studies and it's a, a line of research that would be interesting to pursue. Very much so. So my final question for you um, is, how do you envision today or in the future the ultimate multidisciplinary collaboration between vascular and neurology and cardiology. So you know we have been trying to implement that. Implement that in um, in we did it in ten sites from eight countries. We tried to get neurologists and cardiologists working together, and what we aimed for was to have neurocardiology rounds as one of the uh, tools. The other one was to develop uh, clinical care pathways together as a group and so that they have the same uh, approach. Even between neurologists from the same institution, you can see that approaches are different. So when you compare neurologists with cardiologists, they, they seem to not have the same concepts. So it is very important to have them work together on, on, on basic knowledge, clinical care pathways, and then that's another important issue. And the other thing that we think may work is having a cardiologist as part of the stroke team. Because the vast majority of patients have a cardiac condition that would benefit from the approach of a cardiologist. I completely agree. I think this world is becoming more and more overlapped between our two specialties, which um, probably uh, plays a role in why, you know, you were deciding between these two specialties way back when, when you were deciding how you wanted to go into medicine. So it's very cool to see these two uh, categories and subspecialties of medicine intertwine uh, as we move forward with, you know, providing the best stroke care for our patients. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Spazato, for joining us today. I believe, uh, you know, what you're doing is really changing the lives of, of so many people. And uh, we're definitely very honored to have you join us here at UT Houston for our Grand Rounds today. And uh, we can't thank you enough for being here and spending time with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. As always, ideas and opinions expressed on this podcast are our own and are not a substitute for medical advice. Always contact your doctor before starting any program or therapy to make sure you're getting the best care tailored to your unique situation. UT Health Stroke is on social media. Don't forget, follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook at UT Health Stroke. To stay updated on upcoming episodes, conferences, events, special guests, Remember, share with colleagues, friends, and family. For updates and the latest news on the Stroke Institute, go online again to uth.edu forward slash stroke hyphen institute.